So welcome to the virtual star party that we host here on Google+. The idea is we have at least a couple of telescopes hooked up with live feeds of showing what's uh, visible through that telescope right now. Uh, and I'll be commenting on it. We have uh, Nicole, and I'm not going to try brutalizing your last name. Go Go uh, Gallucci, Gallucci, okay. Um, Nicole Gallucci here to also comment on what we uh, what we bring up in view here. Um, let's see, we have uh, one telescope operated by Gary Ganella and Roy Sid Salisbury is uh, working on another, getting uh, getting another scope up and running for us here. So, um, so sit back and enjoy as we cruise around the sky. <laughs> Nice. You sound like you should be like working a uh, you know a planetarium show. <laughs> We're going <laughs> home. <laughs> I think, and then we have a a person who does run a planetarium show watching tonight. So, well, that that was great, Thad. Uh, yeah. So my name is Fraser Kane, and I am the uh, the publisher of Universe Today. And tonight it's our virtual star party for September sixteenth. 2012. Uh, so we've got a uh, we're sort of reduced. We've got a couple of problems tonight. Number one is there's no moon, which is sort of a, a problem for us because right now it's a new moon, so we're not really going to get much of a you know no moon tonight. And the other problem is that all of the planets are all down. <laughs> so uh, Saturn and Mars have already gone down on the west coast, and uh, Jupiter uh, has yet to rise or Venus on the east coast. So uh, so we're kind of <clears throat> trapped in this horrible middle place right now while we're waiting for all of the the planets and the moon to make their appearance. So in a couple of weeks, it, it, they, it, things will start to be popping again. So this week, uh, like like, uh, like that said, so we've got Gary Ganella, who is located in Los Angeles, and he's showing us this beautiful view of uh, M31, also known as the uh, great, uh, the great Andromeda Galaxy, great Nebula and Andromeda. I think. The good Nebula is so 20th I know. century. I know, I know. It's so, <laughs> so early century. 20th century, yeah. 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 But yeah, this, it's, the, it's the Andromeda Galaxy. Um, and it's and headed then, right for us. <laughs> it is. Look out. Uh, and we've got Roy Salisbury, uh, who is operating for the, for the first time here in our star party. He's operating his, his secret uh, Arizona bunker observatory <laughs> remotely from his home in Las Vegas, which is awesome because Roy is, is always a treat to have joining us. The problem is, is that uh, he has to make this like three-hour drive out to his observatory to be able to actually operate it. And he's got work in the morning and all that kind of stuff. So he's able to actually uh, join us now, which is great. Uh, and then joining us for color commentary, we've got uh, Nicole Gallucci, Dr. Nicole Gallucci, a.k.a. the Noisy Astronomer. Hello. She can wave. She's kind of blurry tonight. I'm not sure why. Yeah, I'm, my home internet's kind of slow. I'm trying to close everything else right now. <laughs> um, we got Scott Lewis, who's joining us. Hi, everyone. And, uh, and he's joined us a second time bringing the Stellarium. So... That's a beautiful view of the of the Great Nebula in Andromeda you've got there, Scott. But can you give people some? <laughs> and then we've got Dr. Thad Sabo, who is a uh, Astro Thad on Twitter, but he's a, a a PhD astronomer and a professor. Where do you teach, Thad? Cerritos College. So it's a community college in uh, the LA area. So. And I just wanted to show people something, which is kind of cool. I'll switch to me for a second here. Uh, so I went to my home of Hornby Island and rescued my telescope from my father, which is good. So this is my actual mm -hmm. telescope. So I'm always using the little uh, Celestron first scope, but I actually have a Celestron Nexstar 114, which actually has a nice go-to scope. And I test it out with my uh, DSLR camera, and it actually uh, it actually works really well. So um, I'm going to start doing some astrophotography, I think is the plan, and I will bring you along with it as I, as I learn this phenomenal hobby. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so let's let's get started. So Roy is madly uh, is going to be madly gathering some images for us. So we'll switch to that. As, and if not, we're going to be relying on uh, on Gary's view tonight. Now that's not a bad thing. It's a beautiful new moon tonight, meaning that it's a completely you know it's the darkest possible sky. We're not going to get um, any. Uh, light pollution from the moon, which is going to be blasting out, uh, you know, and ruining Gary's view. So I think this should be, this is probably the best possible night that we can get out of out of Gary's view. So it's mm -hmm. going to be good. 
It's um, what uh, astronomers call dark time. They kind of fight over this time on the big telescopes because you can, the, when the moon is, is, is at a really small crescent or new, that's when you can see all the deep sky object, objects. How, like. how much dark time do you guys get? That's like, like a week, right? That's, yeah. You, you should observe towards it's about a week of dark time, two weeks of like mid bright, and then a week of bright time every month. And I was talking to astronomers saying like if the if the moon is too is is really low, depending on the on where it is, you can observe on the other side of the sky and right. it can be okay. But you really just hate the moon. Do you think astronomers would be happy if we destroyed the moon? Um, no moon, no atmosphere. That'd be good. So, yeah, yeah, yeah somewhat. <laughs> um, I want to so put a radio telescope on. on the moon, so I don't want it destroyed. But that's just now. Now, Fed, you said that the that it's coming right at us. So, what's the deal with Andromeda looking to kill us? So, well, you know, it's it's. <laughs> It's going to be a very slow kind of death here, but the thing is, the Milky Way has gravity because it has mass. Andromeda has gravity because it has mass, and we could go into the whole Higgs boson thing at this point since we understand that now. But let's let's we'll keep it at this level. Break out um, the math, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Shut up, it's late. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, just the mutual gravitational attraction between the roughly two to four hundred billion stars that make up our galaxy and the two to four hundred billion stars that make up Andromeda Galaxy. Give it about three or four billion years, and we'll be getting real cozy. Milk Dromeda. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, yeah. Milk Dromeda. Milk <laughs> milk Media. I like Milk Dromeda best. Yeah. Um, the Andro way, man. <laughs> now, what's the now? Uh, what's really great in this image as well, and hopefully we can get the. Uh, the mouse action from Gary, but you can actually see the uh, the dust lanes in the galaxy itself, and you can actually see uh, star clusters in those those dark dust lanes. So, uh, would we have something very similar here in in our galaxy? So, our galaxy is a, a barred spiral. So, you can see the the center of Andromeda is a very nice elliptical, very uh, kind of symmetrical from all directions that you you look at it. Um, our galaxy is a distinct you know, elongated shape to the, the nucleus. So, I mean, it's kind of, you know, like a bar. Instead of a nice little ball, like the one for Andromeda, it's, it's stretched out. And our spiral arms kind of come off of either side of the, um, the bar. So, you know, the folks in Andromeda who see us coming right for them, if there's anybody over there, um, they, they have a rather different view from... Uh, than, than we do. Andromeda Galaxy is nice and kind of symmetrical from, from our point of view, but our, our galaxy would be uh, a little bit more visually interesting, I would think. Sorry, Andromeda, but I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I think uh, I, I think we'd win that one. And and think, and think, sorry, and Sterling uh, Gothrop is mentioning on, on Google Plus that uh, this is the only extragalactic object visible to the naked eye from our hemisphere, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, I think Andromeda has a very weak bar in the center that we can't see in an image like that. Um, but one of my friends, uh, Rachel Beaton at, at University of Virginia, has done some dynamical work. And I think they've discovered, like, a really weak bar. Nothing, nothing you know, huge like ours. Uh, so we'll be taking requests. And, and right now it's going to be Gary uh, taking requests. So uh, where did you want to go to next, Gary? Do you want to do some of the big ones? Well, before yeah, I'm going to go over them? to M16. And just for reference, this is a two-minute exposure in hydrogen alpha light. And that's why the center's so blown out because there's a lot of stars there and it's real bright. Right, so. and so M16, this is the uh, this is the Eagle Nebula, which uh, Scott is pointing to right now, and right. it's a classic one. This is where we'll see the uh, the pillars of creation. Yes, we will. Right now, the only thing I want to say earlier. Um, is do the insurance companies have to figure out whether we crashed into uh, Andromeda or they crashed into us? <laughs> well, isn't I mean that, that's the, what did you get there? Is that a satellite there, or a plane? There, that's an airplane. <sighs> there um, a, a yeah, right. I mean, this is the thing that they say. You know, Andromeda and, and the Milky Way are going to collide with one another, but actually, they're like two swarms of bees that are just going to pass each other and not actually. You know, the chance of any stars actually colliding are fairly. When, really, when galaxies really, really collide. Go ahead. So, oh, just um, yeah, just kind of um, reiterating what, what Fraser said that uh, yeah, the, the chances of actual stars colliding is, is is really, really, really tiny. Now, the thing you don't want to be around for is the 
super merge the merger of the two supermassive black holes. That's uh, <laughs> I totally want to see that. Yes. I mean, I would die immediately. But... Has, has that ever been detected? Right, because I mean, this is the idea, right? That there are supermassive black holes at the core of every single galaxy, and then when you get these mergers, these supermassive black holes spiral in on each other and eventually merge. And what then? They They've been seen in different stages of orbiting around each other, um, and the the soup, you know, the, the the billion mass, several billion mass black holes probably formed from some some uh, merger like that in the past. So we've seen the after effects, and we've seen the steps leading up to it. But, I don't know. If, but, I mean, what would actually happen in that moment, right? Boom. A lot so, of boom. gravitational waves. Yeah. <laughs> That's one way in which we're looking for them. Grab your gravitational surfboard. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, I don't know if LIGO has ever detected anything along those. I mean, I know there have been some pulsar or neutron star detections with LIGO, um, but I don't think they've they've seen the kind of you know merger. And then after the black hole forms, it kind of just vibrates. You get what's called a ring down after the the two black holes merge, and that also has a kind of characteristic signature signature to it. Like a you know you strike a bell, it rings with a certain tone. You strike a black hole? Well, not really, but you know, you get smashed <laughs> two of them together and, and it will, the, what the product will ring for a while until uh, things, things settle down. So it's actually mm -hmm. space and time ringing after, uh, after a black hole merger. And so there you go, there's, uh, there's the Eagle Nebula, this is M16, and you can see right there in the middle there, those are those famous uh, pillars of creation. I'm sure at this point Scott oh. will find a, uh, an open source uh, image of the pillars of creation that we can compare and contrast. Um, uh, but uh, but what's what's neat? So these are these like, I mean, what are they? They're like crazy. There's star formation forming regions that are blasting out uh, gas and dust. And actually, they 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 actually think they've been collapsed by now, right? That a supernova in the region has actually detonated and probably destroyed them. We just you know just takes a few thousand years before we'll see it. So, yeah, I mean, there's, um, you know, dark molecular clouds, and you can see them kind of sculpted and shaped by the, the ex extreme amount of radiation from these, these very, very hot young stars that are nearby. Um, so, you know, other things you can see are um, more so from the, the Hubble images. Ah, Scott's got one there you go. right there, <laughs> right? So... Um, you know, these, these kind of fingerlings and tentacles that, that kind of come out of there. So, I mean, there's, there's a star embedded in there, and you see that the, the dense gas and dust is kind of drawn along with it, but then the region around it is kind of cleared out because of all this, uh, this in, intense radiation. And so Gary's image here is, is going to be particularly sensitive to all of this uh, hydrogen that's getting bombarded with a lot of radiation and glowing because, like I said, he said, he's shooting with an, an H-alpha filter. So hydrogen has particular wavelengths that it will glow at strongly, and he's got a filter that selects the, uh, the, the strongest of those wavelengths. So you want to see hydrogen? There you go. Right? He's got us a you know, good look at it right here. Yeah. So. Massive star-forming regions like this form stars of all different sizes, and so the sun was probably formed in a nursery like this, but it's those super massive stars that, um, you know, live fast and die young. They go supernova early. They give up all this ultraviolet light during their lifetime, really kind of power the dynamics of the star-forming star region while it's all together like that. And then all the quiet little, you know, G-dwarfs and, and red dwarfs will kind of spread their way throughout the galaxy for, after that. Now, we're glad to take requests, so if there's some object that you want to see, we're happy to, uh, to point at it. Uh, just to give you a warning, though, things like Orion Nebula is, uh, is not up right now. We'll see it in a couple of months. Um, everyone's favorite. Uh, everyone's yeah. favorite, yeah. I can't wait till it comes back. Uh, and I have to, you know, the, uh, uh, trying to think what else, the, uh, the Horsehead Nebula is also a couple of months away, so we won't be able to show it tonight. Um, and all the planets are down, and all and the moon is down, so we won't be able to see any of those tonight. Good so it's going to be deep sky objects. It's going to be nebulae and clusters, and 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 that's it for the for the night. But uh, and it's going to be Gary, 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 faster, faster, Gary. Um, <laughs> if you want to ask any questions, we're happy to take them. Um, so you can ask questions if you're watching this on the event page on Google Plus. You can ask a question there. Uh, you can also ask a question on Twitter if you're watching this somehow embedded with the hashtag Star Party. Uh, you can also make a comment on Google Plus where it's being posted, hopefully on every location. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, 
uh, you can you can ask a question there as well. Um, uh, so someone wants to see M57. Uh, yeah, that's positioned well. You. Yeah. yeah, I am. What have you got there, Gary, before we move that on? That is the uh, SWAN, the M17. Yep. And that is a 10-second exposure. I'm presently doing a 60-second. We'll see a little more detail. Wow. Okay, great. So, yep. The SWAN also, to some people, they say it looks like a lobster, and that's, uh, that's kind of what I'm getting there, a little claws down at the bottom and yep. kind of a tail toward the back there. So it's called, what, also the Omega, the, I don't know, Horseshoe Nebula, I think I've seen also, but you know, basically people looking at these pictures and kind of free associating. So, if anybody out there is looking, whatever you want to call it, that's fine. I mean, Aridolia <laughs> is fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. And, and the interesting thing in taking photos like this is generally there's a bright area and a not so bright area, and the dynamic range is huge. Yeah. So well, you did some great there. tests doing some HDR photography with uh, with the Orion. It was beautiful what yes. you were doing. Yeah. I have because the feeling there's going to be a whole other season of that where you try to experiment with that. I am. Um, see, if, if I stretch it like this, you can see the detail here in the brightest part. And then when I grab it and bring up the light area, you can see really how much... Yeah area that this nebula covers. So as Fraser said, I experimented a little bit and I'm going to try some more with HDR where I take very short exposures so I can get the center section and then very long exposures and then combine them together. That's a question for you, uh, maybe Thad. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Trevor Soar Videos wants to know, what is the closest star to Earth in the northern hemisphere? And could we see it? Let's see, northern hemisphere, Syria, yeah. So, although technically that's south of the celestial equator, so mm -hmm. that, does that qualify as northern hemisphere? But, um, yeah. Mm. but yeah, it is visible from the northern hemisphere, and you can see it quite easily. But just right about now, you would have to go out around 2 a.m. local time yeah. to uh, to actually be able to see it. So, and see, what are some other ones? I mean, Altair. Uh, part of the southern, the uh, summer triangle, which is it's going to be Altair is going to be pretty high up in the south right now. That's only 16 light years away, so that's fairly close. Um, yeah. Let's see, Vega is about 26 light years away, so it's farther away, but brighter because it's a hotter star. So even though it's farther away, it appears brighter to us in the sky, uh, just because it's hotter, so it's more luminous. How about M51, so, uh, Gary? What are you working on I'm, next? I'm going to M51 right now. Oh, perfect. Okay, great. Yeah, Ready someone, uh, Tim Monk asked for M51, and that is a favorite. I'm happy to spend some time on M51. This is the, uh, what's the what's the other name for it? It's not the Whirlpool, though. That's yep. the Whirlpool. Mm -hmm. It is the Whirlpool. Whirlpool. Okay, yeah, all right. Yeah, so so Scott is bringing up uh, M51 here, and this is what this is what it'll look like in, um, uh, this is what it looks like in Stellarium. Now, a couple people are wondering how we're doing this. Um, with magic. Stellarium, with magic, yeah. So if you haven't already, have any interest in astronomy whatsoever, get your hands on Stellarium, which is a wonderful program. It works on Mac, Windows, Linux. Uh, they've got versions on the iDevices, you know, portable devices. It's free. It's, it's free totally free. The important part. Absolutely yes. fantastic. You know, no, this is not advertising. They are just that awesome. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and you can, uh, and so Scott's just running a version of Stellarium on a screen, and then we can see what it looks like. So there's Gary's yeah, initial, so initial quick one. Yeah. So That's what's that, Gary? Another second. 15 second? That's a 10 second. 10 second exposure. That, so you can uh, see here, when Gary's doing this, he takes um, long exposures of this, and they get better and better. You can pick out fainter and fainter details in the images as he as he goes. I'm just seeing some of the uh, the questions here, and yes, yes, what we're looking at, well, at least what we were looking at with, with the Eagle Nebula and the Swan Nebula, those are gas clouds within our own galaxy. We There are a few that you could see in other nearby galaxies, but the ones that you're going to be able to see a lot of detail in, those are uh, within our own, our own galaxy, a few thousand light years away as opposed to a few million light years away. I uh, see another one, somebody was asking for the crab. Again, well, that's you're going to have to wait until about... Midnight for the crab to be well placed. Sorry. Yeah. The Frontier Crab Nebula. M34. I'm trying to remember. M34 is in. I forget if that's in Cygnus or if that's in Origa. If it's in Origa, mm, not much luck. If it's in Cygnus, it would be well placed, but I can't M34? remember. M34. 
Yeah. It's uh, Perseus Andromeda. Per- Perseus to Andromeda. Okay. okay. That's yeah. nice. That's This looks like 60 seconds now, Gary? Uh, that's a 60 second, and I'm doing a two minute. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Okay. So you can see the, the resolution on it has, has improved quite a bit, and you can see that. So what's going on in this galaxy? I mean, there's like two galaxies here, right? Yeah, and they're interacting. Um, if you, if you, so I'm going to bring up radio astronomy again. If you look at a radio, so you can't necessarily see them interacting as well in the visual light image, but if you use a radio telescope to look at the neutral hydrogen of this gas, there's this huge tail of, of, of hydrogen that's been thrown out of, the ga- out of the larger galaxy from the interaction with the smaller galaxy. And so they're actually, they're not colliding, but they're affecting each other gravitationally. Um, and that might be one of the things that, that gave the Whirlpool Galaxy its beautiful grand design spiral arms is that interaction. So, does the, uh, the gas from that interaction, does it look a little bit like an E off to the one side of the smaller galaxy? Cause I, I know think so. It's like that, that comma coming off. Oh, okay. there we go. Is that it? Yeah, because yeah, I, I think we see a little bit of the E off yeah, to the right of the, uh, the smaller bit. galaxy there. But, yeah, bit. like the size of the screen, it would... Like it would fill up most of the size of the screen if you could have, like superimpose the radio on top of that. Yeah, and this is only I think infrared's the longest wavelength we have yeah, here. Yeah. But. So my my last day of grad school, my first year of grad school, we <laughs> took data. Uh, we took images of M fifty one with an infrared telescope and spent you know like we, we did our last final that day and then spent all night reducing the data for our final project for that class. And so it has a, holds a special place in my heart. Um, Could we do um, a, a cluster next, Gary? Anthony uh, Dewar wants to see a globular cluster, so maybe uh, M13? 13, 15, 2, 22, 55. Hike! No, wait. Do so. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sunday. <laughs> Uh, so a few questions, a few technical questions about Gary's setup here. So, uh, Gary, can you tell people while it's slewing what your your setup is? Uh, yes, I can. Um, let me I see. think you can even show it, but M13 would be uh, yeah, yeah, that's well overhead. Yeah, that'll be nice. Okay, so here's first of all, here's the two minute exposure at uh, M51. So you can oh, see look at that! A little more detail. Ooh. Yeah. And I mean, I know that normally, I mean, your telescope can can track accurately for hours on end. So this is to do a two minute exposure. I know is not doing it any justice. Yeah, I don't. In fact, I don't even have my guide scope running right now. Normally, <laughs> when I do long exposures, I've got the guide scope running so it'll follow it. But the mount's good enough for a two minute exposure without getting any hiccups. Yeah. Uh, okay. So M thirteen. All right. Let's do. Uh, and can you show the? Can you show your your telescope while it's slewing? I can. Let me see if I brought that window up. Hang on. I got to bring that window up. I ask for so much. Yes, you do. <laughs> so demanding. So um. I don't know how familiar everyone is with exposure. I'm sure you guys are all veterans who are watching, but uh, sure. if you're not, it's just having, you know, you're collecting, if you think of collecting photons as collecting, you know, like raindrops in a bucket, the longer you have the bucket out is the longer it's exposed and the more raindrops or photons or light you've collected. And so that's why you can see fainter objects with a longer exposure. Which is why they call large aperture telescopes light buckets. Light buckets. Catching those photons. Uh, there's a... <laughs> Where I was, I was just on Hornby Island. Like I said, it's a small island off the coast of Canada, and uh, there's a guy there who runs an observatory. He's got a 25-inch Dobsonian Ooh, nice. setup. That's yeah. a light bucket. Yeah, totally. I, I've used it. Uh, I've, I've, you know, I've looked through it before. You and can shoot just, a person out of that. It's mind-bending <laughs> what you can do. You know, you don't need it to track. You just, just, you know, cool you just person. take snapshots of the night sky. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty amazing. So that was that was cool. So that was Gary. So so right. And so actually, um, somebody just posted Gary's stats. So I don't need to. So uh, Gary has a Celestron C14 on a right. CGE mount. His camera is a QSI 583. He shoots using. It's actually a si- it's a 683 now. Oh, it's a 683. You upgraded your camera. Oh, I upgraded to the 683. There you go. He shoots using Hyperstar, which lets him mount the camera to the front corrector plate instead of the back of the camera. So he is shooting at f1.9 instead of f10. 
Thank you very much, Michael Fields. That was awesome. Oh, you have a stalker, Gary. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you can see, he's, he's currently sitting in the uh, in the room wearing a green shirt. With the air conditioning running, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you can see how this is much closer to the zenith than the other things we were shooting. Yeah, straight it's up. almost straight up. So let me uh, let me give you a shot of M13. Do you have a lot of light pollution in your area? He's in Los Angeles. On the horizon? Oh, okay. <laughs> no, it's nice and clear. <laughs> nice and clear. <laughs> See the Milky Way overhead every night. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's orange. Did you know the Milky Way was orange? It's right over the LA. The whole sky's it's orange. Oh, beautiful. Ooh. Nice. All right. Is that like a little something in the upper right corner as well? There's a little oh. something, a little uh, like a little galaxy just to the upper right of it. Oh, the little fuzzy? Yeah, a little fuzzy bit. I, don't know. I think that's a star. I think this is a star right here. I can't tell on the fuzzy connection that I have. <laughs> no, it's not. It's it's. You probably don't have it turned on. It's a little to the right of that. Yeah, yeah. So the F. I mean the F one point nine. That's the part. This is Tim O'Neill just said this on uh, on Google Plus. That's the trick, right? Is that you got an F one point nine? So. He could fit, I think, I think we calculated six full moons in his field of view. So, um, you know, while most people are only able to observe a tiny little portion of the moon at any time, he's got mountains of, of the sky. And so he can capture these really big, dim uh, nebulae and things like that. Right. It's if I shoot setup. the full moon, it's about this big in my yeah. field of view. Um, yeah. That's great. So what's the what's the exposure for for the uh, for the M13, Gary? This is a 10 second minute four by four. I'm going to try a fast one with lower binning. We maybe get a little more detail out of it. That's no, nice though. So if you look at a globular cluster with your telescope, that's the oldest thing you will see with your eyes, which is pretty cool. All these stars are you know around 13 billion years old. Yeah. Uh, in fact, up until you know a few decades ago, astronomers weren't sure how, or they had dated the the globular clusters to be older than mm -hmm. the universe, which was yes. kind of unusual. <laughs> right. Globular cluster dynamics has rather large error bars. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And back then, cosmology had even larger even error bars. Yes. <laughs> right. Because so. luminiferous ether, right? Come on. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, this was after that was disproven. <laughs> Not by very long, but it was. Oh. <laughs> and the Andromeda, Andromeda Nebula was Nebula, still yep. Nebula. Yep. Is this Is this it's still it, Gary? Same thing? Yeah. This this is M13 out of 10 second, but with no binning. Very so I'm using cool. the full resolution. And the noise oh, is a little really bit nice. higher, but you can see a little more detail here in the center. Oh, that's awesome. And what yeah. if, if you do a longer exposure, will it get better or get worse? Um, the outer stars will get better, the inners will get worse. Right. So it's the same type of thing if I wanted to get too bright in the middle here. Yeah, I'd need to do um, do high, high dynamic range. Uh, oh, that uh, is M13. Right, I've been reminded that I should do a blatant plug for you, Wingu, and I will absolutely do a plug for you, Wingu. Um, Thanks, Pamela. I assume uh, it was Pamela. <laughs> I don't think it wasn't even Pamela. Oh, was okay. Who is actually... Working on coding. She's working on a winger right now. Right now. Which is, right. Yeah. But uh, right. So, so Nicole, do you do you can you make the new, the U Wingo pitch? Uh no. You can probably no. Be okay. Better. Well, then I will. Um, <laughs> I don't have one prepared. So we've got to, we've got right. So U Wingo yeah. is a sort of new way of funding space uh, exploration, and uh, so we've got a uh, Kickstarter. It's actually on, oh, it's on an Indiegogo uh, to to raise funds for this, and they've got about eight days left, I think, in the. Uh, yeah, they just in got the, an extension. In the, in the right. fundraising campaign, yeah. Fundraising so campaign. you can go to uh, do a search for Uwingu, and then you'll be able to find it uh, find it there. You so. yep. wing, like flapping you wings. Wing -goo. And you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, if, and, if uh, I talk about Uwingu, I'll go on a rant about science funding. So Yeah, no, I know, me too. To this is, it's kind of like all we talk about is like, how can we get money for space? So, so this is a way that you can participate and help uh, fund space. And there's a lot of really cool things. Pamela's you know, Dr. Pamela Gay, my co-host with Astronomy Cast, is deeply involved. Uh, I'm helping out. Uh, it's you know led by Alan Stern, who was uh, 
you know, used to be with NASA and was the uh, the what their director of what planetary science. So it's a it's an amazing group of people behind it and some really neat ideas. So uh, definitely check that out. It's a uh, ultimate put your money where your mouth is if you like space science. Um, and yeah, I'm going to do a shout out to just rely on the NSF pot and the NASA pot anymore. So I'm going to do a shout out to Brian Dunning who's now watching, which is awesome. Hey Brian. I'm Brian Dunning. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the host of Skeptoid podcast, which is a fantastic podcast, and you should absolutely listen to it. And his uh, he does a, a video series as well, which is great. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the kids love it. Uh, what is this? This it's is pretty. a Lagoon Nebula. M8. Oh, look at that. And that is a 10-second uh, at a 4x4 four four binning, and I'm now doing a 60-second at a 2x2, by two by two, which will give us a little more detail. Wow. Yeah, that's really that, awesome. That does look terrific. So it does it have color, Gary? Come on. Um, yes, it does. It, it, <laughs> it, there is white and there is black. Now the white is all colors. The black and is no color. And ultraviolet. Let's not be visual visibleist here. <laughs> I'm a I'm I'm big in surface, so. kids. <laughs> wow! Mm. Look at the detail, though. And that one, uh, let me stretch it a little bit here. Trying not to let profanity fly. I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> so pretty. And, and like so many things, the center wow. is uh, extremely bright. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. And if I go this way, we yeah, can start awesome. seeing. Here we can see some of the detail in the centers. Generally, those are um, some pretty, wouldn't you say those are some pretty bright um, blue stars? Yeah, definitely. At that point, that. Definite O-class stars that are putting out enough ultraviolet light to get the whole thing glowing with that. Just imagine it as a red color, right? So for hydrogen, mm -hmm. so. And then as I start yanking out, oh jeez, that is yeah. that is awesome. Start to see some of the details in the dark. So yeah, lanes. so those dark lanes again. That's kind of just like the pillars of creation. This is a region where the stars are forming. So look at that baby star. Oh, cute. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not pooping over everything. It's it's awesome. <laughs> no, it, it. But as as God Phil said, piss. it will be sh it will be shooting gas out of both ends. Yes, right? <laughs> Um, this is the second hangout that's brought up poop in my life. <laughs> oh, the Curiosity <laughs> Rover one? Yeah, yeah we're, we're, we're finding out whether or not the Curiosity Rover pooped. Yeah. Um, it poops all the time. Which it does. Well, it doesn't poop. It regurgitates like an owl. Yeah, um, it okay. uh, Mistress Tatiana <laughs> wants to know uh, if we're going to see the moon. Um, unfortunately, we can't see the moon. It's a new moon. So we get beautiful dark sky stuff, deep sky stuff, but we don't get the moon. Come back next week. Next week we'll have we'll have a nice crescent moon. It'll be beautiful. This big dark spot right there is the moon. It's dark. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on a second here. Yeah, they, there's the moon. Yeah. Tiny little bit of light, but it's but it hasn't oh, even wow. risen yet, right? It's waning. Right, I've got the ground turned off. Oh, okay, what I love good, about yeah. my, my That's what you love about to Solarium. Turn the, to turn the, uh, the ground <laughs> turn the sun off. off. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, the sun's right there. But who cares? I see thirteen ninety six has been requested. Can we do that one? Let me see. Let me look. That's the elephant trunk. We did that a few weeks ago, didn't we? Yes. We did that a few weeks ago. Is that in Cygnus? Perseus? Thirteen ninety six. No, Cygnus is more seven thousands. That's right. Yeah, it's just near um Yeah, it's just near Deneb. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. Kind of, uh, yeah, south of Deneb. That sounds good. Is that the other part of the of the nebula? That's the uh, Trifid. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm not straight on it. Let me give a little bit longer exposure. I like how a little south of Deneb is, like, astronomer directions. <laughs> a little south. <laughs> no, just a tad. Go, go two fist lengths from <laughs> south of Deneb. <laughs> okay, so this is yeah, M21, the Trifid. And this one is really nice if you have true color filters. Yeah. 
So this time of year, I'm, I haven't been outside in a while, but I'm assuming the Milky Way is nearly overhead still at yes. this time of night, and that's yeah. why we're seeing all these great you know, star-forming regions in Canada. Just had a request for M83, but unfortunately M83 is down. Oh, yeah, oh, long yeah. down, long down. If we could turn off... Gary, can you turn off the Earth? Yes, <laughs> but you wouldn't, you wouldn't like it. <laughs> Um, the coat hanger cluster, that's a good one, but you, that doesn't even fit in your field of view, does it, Gary? No, I don't get a good shot of that. Yeah. Binoculars. Yeah, you gotta use, use binoculars. binoculars to find it. But, but seriously, totally like, if you want a treat, get your hands on a pair of binoculars and learn where the coat hanger cluster is, because it looks exactly like a coat hanger. Yes. It's like a line of stars with a little hook on it. It's great. When I was a little teeny teenager growing up in Staten Island, New York, it's about the only thing I could find. <laughs> cool, <laughs> we've got a bunch of requests guys. now. Um, NGC 5128. What's that? Oh, that's uh, Centaurus A. Yeah, also that's down. also way down. Yeah. Barely visible from from here. Yeah. So. Okay. It's very this bright is, um, before I move on to the IC, oh. this, is, this is the Triffid. Rather than moving the scope, mm -hmm. I just zeroed in on that part of the field. Wow. But this area is very red. Uh, if you can take this with true color filters, yeah, exactly as Scott is showing, you can see that out here there's a lot of blue area, which mm. I don't pick up because I'm looking at the hydrogen. The blue would be mostly yeah. oxygen, wouldn't it? Actually, the blue is a reflection nebula, so it's dust mm -hmm. that's nearby. And just like our, our sky is blue because it scatters uh, shorter wavelength light, the, the air in the atmosphere is better at scattering that. You have dust that's in a region near the uh, Trifid Nebula, and so it preferentially scatters blue light back at us. So, um, so I mean, yeah, the ox oxygen would be a little bit greener hue than that. I mean, if, if you were looking at, say, the center of the, the Ring Nebula, that is the kind of color you get from oxygen, but this, this much bluer tone is... Um, it's yeah, it's dust that's scattering light at us. So okay, and it was thirteen ninety six. So when your kids ask why is the sky blue, say it's scattering. Now eat your vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> and then when they ask what scattering is, get them together with about twenty five other kids and have them run into each other. <laughs> <laughs> I love like kinetic astronomy activities like that because you can get them to wear themselves out and then they can listen to you. <laughs> and they'll collapse on their back, look up at the sky at yes. the very end of it. Yes. We I mean, used to do that. Because that's how we. <laughs> All right. Oh, Fraser is rejoining. Oh, we're back on air now. Stop dancing. Okay. We're back on air. Stop dancing. <laughs> Everybody, at home. I have no shame, Scott. Okay. <laughs> dancing. Where's Fraser? Hey, Fraser's here twice. Wow. <laughs> so we go from no Fraser to two Fraser's. To double, double the Fraser. That's Canadian He's budding right there. All Heisenberg on us. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> oh. This is very entertaining, but we should get back to what's in the sky. Yeah, we're on yeah. air, Fraser. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was good. We had to change ourselves, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> well, it happened. No, but I don't think it, it went anywhere. It. We were showing off air for a while. Now we're back on air. Okay, yeah. Um, no, you were you off air? Did people did it disappear for everybody? I'm seeing hangouts. We'll be right back. Lo veremos pronto. But it's back <laughs> now. Yeah, I think is it back on? We're I, back. I'm, I'm showing on air now. 
Wir sind gleich wieder zurück. Okay, yeah. somebody, somebody type at us and tell us if you can see us yeah. right now. <laughs> yeah, I think so people can see us. Okay, good. Yeah. That was really weird. Sorry about that. It was like it just, it slowed down and it slowed down and then it just stopped working and then it said we're unable to restore your connection and then it dropped me out. So, um, Way to go, Internet. <laughs> Way to go, Internet. Elephant Trunk Nebula. So cool. I can see it now. Yes. <laughs> nope. Elephant trunk. Nope. Need to give you the echo there. Yes. Um, this is a 10-second exposure of it. Can you can you move down a little bit? Uh, yeah. Let me see what the 60-second because there's stuff Bryce in here we're too. Lost. Hang and on. I'm, I'm not quite sure whether this is the elephant trunk or this is the elephant trunk. I think it's the one up top there. That totally looks like an elephant trunk. Yep. I think. Okay, then uh, let me do this exposure and I'll bring it down a little bit. So that's a 10 second, this is a 60 second. And what is it? It is not an elephant. It's not an elephant truck. <laughs> we can, oh, there we go. Oh, oh, you can really see okay. it. Oh, yeah, I can it's see a, it. It's, it's a half a lump. <laughs> so it is. Uh, a it looks dark like it's nebula. Backlit, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So again, you have the, the hydrogen being pumped full of energy by some very hot, bright blue stars in the region, and then an overlay of colder, darker material in front. So we get this kind of silhouette of an elephant and its trunk hanging there in the sky. And this whole area is gl glowing with um, hydrogen light. Excited hydrogen. That was a great suggestion. Who who recommended that? That was a wonderful suggestion. Kudos to you. Kudos. Kudos. Well, who else has got it suggestions? Was Jeremy here? Taylor. So go, Jeremy, Jeremy Taylor. Taylor. Yeah. You were awesome. Awesome sauce, Jeremy Taylor. Keep them coming, Jerry. We, yeah. we, we, we don't give away prizes, more. but pat yourself on the back. So. I give thumbs up. You get okay. the universe. Yeah. Um, so someone said that we're jumping via voices from person to person. Oh, interesting. Okay. Hold on. You're not. Oh, oh, we probably need to reset the focus. Yeah. Yeah. Oops. Sorry about that. Thank you for telling me. I've okay. I'm. I've joined it twice, and so when I joined the Hangout twice, is it, so? Is this? Did this fix it? By the way, now that it's. Please let me know if this is working because I've, I've now I've, in ideally shifted control back to my main desktop computer. So, anyway, people can let me know. Okay. Yeah, I can only see what I'm. I've been. Right. The people in the hangout have no idea, and so I was yeah. clicking on Gary's view of the uh, of the nebula, but it was wasn't working. So, I'd be good to know if this is working for everybody again. Man, getting when the host gets dropped out of a hangout, it's a catastrophic uh, event <laughs> yeah, that has to be recovered. So, I, it'd um, be kind of nice if they... So, new Hangout idea. If the host drops out, give those privileges and let someone know who it is. So, Yeah, that's a good idea. Anyone, if anyone could, could take over. Um, uh, okay, so uh, the Cat's Eye Nebula, is that down? Let me look. So where... What constellation is, is this near? Where are we? This is near... Near Deneb, right? So okay. it's going to be pretty close to overhead right about now. Yeah. We've got a quest. We've got so, a request for M57, which we haven't done. So I don't know, Gary. I I, I love M57. If we could. Yeah, that's going to be better than the cat's eye. I mean, most of these planetaries are really small, and yeah. so with the field of view that we have, it would look like, well, there's a little smudge dot, something or other. No, that's not very, you know, not something to to try pulling up. Yeah. So I've had public nights like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never smudge. know. The things that are going to work. I mean, I, I hope I wish I hope Gary has kept a list somewhere because there's a lot of stuff that we started to find in the fall that he was like, oh, I'm going to try this. It's you know Thor's, um, Thor's helmet, helmet, and helmet. it was fantastic yeah. And, yeah. and stuff like that. And so yeah. other stuff that you think head. is going to work really well it just doesn't look that good. Mm -hmm. The monkey head is awesome too. I remember oh yes, I yeah. This is just another one. I moved it. To. <clears throat> Move it down a little bit so you can see more of that. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's beautiful. Okay, M57 coming up. Uh, 
Okay, the America Nebula, NGC 7000, and 57. Which is MGC? What's NGC 7000? That's the North American yes, Nebula. That is North the North American, American Nebula. Nebula. Yeah, well, that's Gary's favorite. He's probably, his telescope will just drift back to the North American Nebula on its own. Even if he's not, uh, he just loves that yeah, one Yeah, but so I can only see parts of it. <laughs> uh, can we see Gallifrey? Rob Ross wants to know if we can see Gallifrey from here. <laughs> has any has anybody decided where Gallifrey is? It's, it's, it's in the southern hemisphere. Barrows. Come it's on. in the southern hemisphere. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, come on, it's Tardis not a matter Cup. Of, Take us to Gallifrey. Um, it's so, not a matter uh, of where, it's a matter Burford of when. Wants to know if we can see the uh, Carina Nebula, and we cannot because we're in the northern hemisphere. And we're all very upset about that. Yeah. yeah. It'd, be, it'd be the wrong time of year anyway because that's kind of just due south of where the sun is in the sky right now. Yep. A <laughs> tiny little ring nebula. Tiny little. Yeah, this is because Gary's view is so big. I, I mean, know. it's for most people, the ring bit. nebula takes up a much larger field of view, but in Gary's view, it's teeny tiny. The death of a star. What is it? What happened to the ring nebula? In general? What is it? <laughs> Okay, so I brought like, astronomers, two PhD <laughs> astronomers. <laughs> Somebody, I, I, I thought, I thought like something happened recently, and I'm like, yeah. what's doing this? <laughs> what happened to the star previously? Yeah. So it just got bloated. It uh, reached the end of its life. It puffed out all this gas around the edge of it, and there, you know, so we were looking at a bubble kind of edge on, and. Uh, yeah, so you can see the the edge of the bubble it looks like a ring, and now you have seven days. Sorry, oops, wrong yeah. oh, ring. Oh, oh, and all right, that fine. Means. Sorry, no, that that was great. I approve that joke. That was. Good. Oh no, he left. I I couldn't I couldn't let that stand. Oh. <laughs> no. You're a terrible person. No, I didn't kick him out. I know. The internet kicked him out. Oh. Come this, back, Thad. This Come very back, quiet Dad. death is how, you know, most stars like our sun, the normal like ours. Normal size and smaller yeah. stars, they I've just re slowly redundant swap PhD off astronomers layers. here. Perfect. Think, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and if you, you think I'm about it, I'm not talking it, anymore. The way our sun stays as spheric areas, is there's this balance between the outward push of energy and gravity holding it together, keep it as this ball. This, what happens with the ring, is just oh, that's one nice. is overtaking the other. Yeah. So the outward push of energy is just overcoming the gravity and holding it in. That's a oh, goes, that's a really great shot, my Gary. Entire stellar astrophysics yeah, course. see, now I did that at full <laughs> resolution at a one-to-one. -one. So I can zoom in and get some detail. And Which Pamela has informed me that that star at the center of it is not part yes. of the nebula. It is it's another yet. star behind it. Because there is, is not a white dwarf like core of the star left over inside, but it's not what we're looking at in that picture. But that's the the, uh, the ultraviolet radiation again from the the uh, the central white dwarf is what's lighting up that nebula around it. So again, UV light powering everything pretty. So welcome back, Dad. Did you take some time to think about your bad joke? <laughs> I liked it. <laughs> That's 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 really that's really nice, Gary. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's awesome. You can absolutely see that that just that filament structure. The the color view is nice because it does give you those like greens in the middle and and purples. But uh, maybe we'll get that next week. Um, if my telescope will find anything, I'll get them for you. Uh, oh, <laughs> Christian Flores asked: Is does, it, does Planet X exist? In your mind. In my mind. <laughs> In your mind. Because all the exo, all the how a thousand, what like a thousand exoplanets, like that's not enough for people. Yeah, yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah. Right. So the question is, you know, he's he's asking, is there this theorized object called Planet X, which is a you know somehow connected to the solar system and is going to come into the inner solar system in 2012 and cause the Earth to flip its Orientation or Absolutely. something. Absolutely. So run. Yeah. Right. The, so I looked but, at the Delarium. But, you know, the, Delarium the reality of course is not found. Yeah. <laughs> not found. So the so the reality oh, yeah. of course is no, it does not exist. Um, 
uh, any object that was even like a little larger than, well, I mean, the size of Pluto, which is a fraction of the size of our moon, would be visible in the outer, outer solar system and would be visible to, visible to astronomers for for decades. It would take 100 years to, like, reach us if it really was what's out there. Um, although, there's, I mean, there are some interesting theories that there is a, you know, like a brown dwarf mm -hmm. companion to the to the sun that might be, you know, at some point in the far future might be the cause of why we have a rise in the number of um, comets and asteroids every, say, 65 million years. So there's some interesting theories, but but no, there's there's absolutely no science to this possibility that we're going to get, uh, that there's some planet that's going to come out of the darkness and, and pass near the Earth. Yeah, yeah. Do, if astronomers put any um, faith or not faith, but, you know, if, if astronomers thought that there was anything to these 2012 doomsday scenarios, we would have so much funding right now. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. To, pre to be doing <laughs> stuff to prevent it, that, you know, we would have been all over that. Yeah. There's no, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and besides, um, any, any planet like that, Mike Brown would have likely found it by now, or if yeah. he hadn't, the WISE data would have found it. Yeah. So. He would have killed... Planet X was killed by Mike Brown a long time ago. <laughs> I don't Brown. know why we're talking about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he shot it out with his big gun of planet killing doom. <laughs> yeah, the wise, the infrared space telescope, uh, wise. But we we actually did a whole episode of, of this on uh, Astronomy Cast, which was great, and we sort of covered all of these these issues and covered sort of some of the underlying science as well, because there have been some legitimate searches for. Uh, some kind of planetary companion. I mean, most most stars in the Milky Way are actually binary and, and multiple star systems. That's the the vast majority of stars out there actually do have planet you know, or stellar companions. So it's not unreasonable that there could be other objects. It's just everything moves so slowly and so distant that you know it's not like right now we don't see anything, and the next year we see something. So yeah. And we've also got a, a string of articles as well about Planet X on Universe Today. So, In fact, we, we're so certain that nothing's going to happen um, that uh, plug, me and plug. Pamela, I'm plugging again, are going to be um, going to uh, the Mayan ruins uh, on December 21st, 2012, and we're going to stand right at the point of the apocalypse at uh, on the Yucatan and wait for nothing to happen. So, yeah. Except really cool archaeology. Except some really cool archaeology, yeah. yeah. So and apparently there's going to be another to... boat that is... So we're going to be on a cruise called the yeah. Not the End of the World Cruise. And you can join us uh, if you go to astrosphere.org uh, and then do a, there's a link there to the Not the End of the World Cruise. Um, we're going to do live episodes of Astronomy Cast and, and just hang out. So it'll be really fun. Which but, one of uh, you yeah, is putting apparently me in your luggage? What's that? Which one of you is putting me in your luggage to sneak me aboard? I don't know if that's been figured out yet. But the, but the funny size. thing as well is uh, is there's going to be another cruise that's like, I forget what, the, how, what they were describing it, but they're, you know, looking for the spiritual, uh, you know, revelation that's going to happen on December 21st. So, you know, we'll wave to each other. I think. Palm. Yeah. That is the spiritual yeah. realization is face palm. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so that's the North American Nebula. Is that the Canada yes. part? Um, this that is looks like the Gulf of Mexico center. part. Oh. Uh, it is. It oh, is. okay. This is the Gulf here in Mexico. If we look, um, I'll pop my view over, and the purple square is just about my field of view okay. right at the moment. So you can see there's the Pelican Nebula up here, and there's a whole lot. It would take to get this whole thing. It would take probably twenty shots stitched together, and that's going to be your life's work. Um, uh, yeah, I'll let you know when that's done. <laughs> <laughs> Gary will live longer than that. He falls through <laughs> roofs and he comes back and does virtual star parties. I, Gary Strickner. Did you hear you about fall that? Fall off a roof. He fell through the roof. Fell through the yes, roof. Yeah. Yes, that's a whole different story. Nice. Um, through the ceiling uh, and not all the way through just one leg. Uh, BM Burford <laughs> asked for the Pleiades. That's not up yet. Sorry. Um, how does Pleiades look in your in your it's telescope, Gary? Does it fit? Um, like stars. It's, it's, it's like an <laughs> another open good binocular stars. object. Yeah, yes, you don't get any of that nebulosity at all. No, um, I do with long exposure. I've taken some great pictures with real uh, with uh, true color filters. 
and got uh, some no, very nice pictures, but. Yeah, that's Pleiades. So Pleiades is, is will be rising in the, in the next, well, it depends on where you are. If you're in the East Coast, it's already up in the East. If you're on the West Coast, it'll be up in another hour or so. Um, uh, Did I tell you about the time I met a guy from the Pleiades? Like, have you Did met you somebody from the Pleiades? He said he was born in the Pleiades. Wow. <laughs> Just had to throw that in. That's my Pleiades story. Uh, so the ba the Bowers <laughs> Jay asks Gary, can you show your teles can yeah. your telescope show colors with planets? So no, it can't. Uh, Gary has a uh, has a monochrome camera CCD, and so it's really good for showing these really faint deep sky dark sky objects. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't work well with the planetary stuff. So so usually when the planets are up, we have someone else. Who's covering the planets and the moon, and, and Gary brings the detail. So, uh, the, someone asked for the Veil Nebula, Gary, if you're feeling uh, in the neighborhood. Um, okay. And it's once close, again, that's right? a uh, a very big object you can get pieces of. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we did so start off with Andromeda Galaxy, which is bigger than your field of view too. So. Yeah. Yes. Just go with the theme. Uh, so Stephen Jett asks, are there any planets up tonight? No, there are no planets up tonight. Uh, the Earth. The, the Earth, yes. yeah, which Earth is causing us up. some problems. The Earth is down. down. We keep trying to yeah. turn the Earth off. It doesn't work. So no, so Saturn and Mars uh, have gone down. Uh, Jupiter is yet to rise. Probably won't rise for another two hours or so um, for us on the West Coast. From the East Coast, it's just come up. But, uh, yeah. So we'll be getting beautiful Jupiter. Don't worry, it's going to be the Jupiter show here on the Virtual Star Party starting in about another month or so. And it'll just be Jupiter, Jupiter, Jupiter. Can't get enough of it. You really can't. Can't get enough of that Jupiter, yeah. Now, now did anyone try and observe the uh, that recent impact that happened? I know there was, like, something... There was a great some great video of, like, a little puff of smoke off the surface of Jupiter last last week, but I don't think anybody actually... Saw much of a of a of an impact, any damage. No, I just saw what you posted on Universe Today that that Flickr link. Yeah, it had like yeah four seconds. It was awesome. I was yeah, you can see a little doing... like a little mushroom cloud off the surface of Jupiter, but then that was <laughs> who it. nuked Jupiter? Who nuked Jupiter? Who nuked yeah. it? <laughs> really? Surface, surface. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it, oh, it was sad. Cool, I think though. you're muted. If you've been trying to contribute, you have yeah, not Yeah, I was. Been. Okay, that's that way I was. Never mind. <laughs> Still, it's um, a bad joke filter. We put that yeah, on what you're yeah, That was it. I like the joke. <laughs> I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> it was good. Thank you, Nicole. I like that movie. <laughs> yeah. But... Um, yeah, I think I think there were some some stack pictures of Jupiter from earlier in the week, and I was hoping that people would post them mainly because I uh, was wondering if I wanted to get my scope out this weekend if there was any features showing up in the atmosphere from the impact, but nothing was really showing up, and uh, I've got oh, a lot of grading to do and other stuff. So, <laughs> what do we got? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at the, so there's the Veil Nebula. That's a ten second, and I'm doing a sixty second right now. The Veil Nebula is just gorgeous. Wow. And, and the Veil Nebula, this is all part of a recent-ish uh, supernova explosion, right? Yeah, within the past, I think, what, 7,000 to 10,000 years? Oh, that was like yesterday in astronomical terms. Yeah. 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 From, yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. 10 minutes ago. That's really close. <laughs> but there's yeah. a bunch of pieces, right, in the sky. There's like this, and there's like the Crescent mm -hmm. Nebula, and there's... Well, the crescent's not part of it. The crescent is... Oh, uh, not? Separate. Okay. Yeah, the because crescent is... There's a few is... other chunks uh, yes. that are part of this explosion, right? There's the witch's broom part. There's the... Cirrus uh, East. I think this is the Cirrus East that I'm looking at right now. Yes. There's the Cirrus East Nebula, the Cirrus Nebula Northwest part, uh, the Veil Nebula or the Cirrus Nebula, and then there's a bunch of stuff in between. But the way this shot is, um, the other half of this is probably two fields of view up to the top direction. If that made any sense at all. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So the thing is if we could see 
with uh, x-rays instead if our eyes were sensitive to that. I mean, no, it's not like Superman being able to look through clothing or whatever. No, get that out of your heads. Um, it's, it's more just you would see all of this uh, region that's been jazzed up with energy from the supernova explosion and would look very spherical on the, s the sky. It would look, you know, many times the size of the full moon, um, this region that's kind of suffering the after effects of the, the explosion that was the supernova. We see little wisps around the edge of it where there are parts that are glowing with, uh, with visible light. But in, in x-rays, it actually is quite spherical. Yeah, supernova remnant physics. It was really fun to study in high, my high energy class, but uh, all these different shocks. So, so what we're seeing at the edge there is, is from one of those, those shocks that came through. You have a shock, and you have a backward shock, and you have all of this, this really dynamical stuff happening when, when a massive star like that explodes. What's the, uh, what are these, um, what's this program that you're using, Gary, to show uh, the, the Sky X? The Sky um. X. And I like it because I can control the scope with it. Uh, it's not a free one, but um, I've right. gotten used to it. This is the um, this is what we're looking at right here, and you can see the other part of the veil is up here. There's pieces in between, so the the orientation isn't turned right. But this purple square is my field of view. Stop that. So you can see we're right about in here. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think um, I think we need to uh, wrap up. Maybe do uh, one last uh, one last object. Does anyone have a uh, preference? Can you do the double cluster? I know it's kind of stars without the color. You really oh, who's <laughs> asking for it? Sorry, that's one of my favorites. It's one it of is, few things it is I nice, but I you know I'll warn you. It's as Gary yeah. said, it's just stars because without the color, you don't really get the mm -hmm. um, uh, you don't get all of the I don't know the subtlety of it. So. Mm -hmm. That's a great splash of stars, though. I mean, it is lovely, yeah. And you've got a nice wide field of view, but it's almost like it's still too wide. It's not wide enough for the for that cluster. So we oh we lost Roy. So Roy, I you know we were trying to cover for him. Roy's been battling his uh, telescope all night. Uh, it got lost somehow. So he actually found that it wasn't able to uh, orient. And he's the problem is that Roy set up in, remotely. He's got this wonderful observatory set up remotely that he can now control from his living room. Uh, it, except when he can't, <laughs> and he can't just go and whack it. You know, he's he's got to drive to it. So. there. Uh, how about Stephen's quart Stephen's quartet NGC seventy three thirteen. I don't know if the quartet's going to show really well, but there's a great, uh, terrific spiral galaxy that's just a little bit north of it, NGC 7331. And I think with Gary's field of view, you'd be able to get that, plus what's called the Deerlick group. I'm not sure where they come up with these names, but it's a group of galaxies. It's around 7331, and then uh, Stefan's quintet yeah. is... Um, Below uh, south and a little bit west of it. So, you want to try that? It's pretty. Yep. It could be pretty small. So, NGC seventy three thirty one. So northern Pegasus. Um, so uh, Tam JD one asked for uh, the Horsehead Nebula. Unfortunately, it's not up yet with Orion. We we still need a couple of uh, months before we'll be able to start seeing the Orion Nebula and the Horsehead Nebula. So uh, if you look at some of our older ones, we've got lots of Horsehead Nebula and lots of uh, Orion Nebula. And Teal is making some suggestions to us. So He's got clouds, so he can't uh, show us the sun, but he's got uh, his brain is working overtime, so that's great. Which is good, because he's standing upside down. Yeah. <laughs> so all the blood's flowing to his head? That would make sense then. Yeah. So did you, did you get that, Gary? Yeah, seventy three thirty one. I'm on. Yeah, it. and then Teal is saying NGC seventy three seventeen. Seventy two thirteen, wasn't it? Well, he's saying seventy three thirteen. We just did uh, seventy three thirty one. Yeah, seventy three thirty one. there, and that's a um, a ten second. We're into so just to warn everyone, we're into new territory here. Things we've never observed. So science. <laughs> Nobody's ever seen this before. Nobody's ever seen this galaxy ever. before. Is that it zoomed in there, Scott? I'm actually I'm not getting the galaxy up here in Stellarium. Yeah. I'm still I just I have all the the data sets, but there's just so much out there. Having well, you don't have the galaxy turned on. Yeah, I do. I had an Andromeda so, earlier. So this is down, when they, they, so this is when they wonder the why. Uh, why Messier missed this one? 
I mean, this is uh, definitely the part of this, you know, definitely part of the sky he would have surveyed, and it's it's like magnitude seven and a half, magnitude eight. So mm. it's it's a binocular object, even. But uh, but yeah, didn't make it into his list of 109, or I guess what 100 plus whatever they added after he uh, passed on there. So. so people wanted to know how much your setup costs, Gary. Is your wife in the room? <laughs> this is recorded. This is recorded. This is recorded. Um, um, well, let's just say that that it it has cost enough. multiple tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah. Over time. Over time. Uh, Over time. Probably. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you if you buy just a telescope, that's about a ten thousand dollar telescope or so. We, yeah, the scope and the mount yeah. about ten. Yeah, and then mount, and then he's got an observe. He's got an actual dome, and yeah. Yeah, and that's about with shipping and everything. That was four or five thousand, and the camera is about five thousand. So, in the twenty range. Yeah. So people who are looking for Stefan's quintet, it's in the upper right corner of the uh, of the picture right. here. Yep. Itty bitty, teeny weeny, mm -hmm. itty bitty galaxies full of stars. <laughs> Let me see if I can do a little better exposure here. Um, I'm starting to lose my focus too. Mm. Yeah. Although you know, then you find this is you get hooked on this stuff, and I've just ordered myself a portable air conditioner <laughs> so I can get the scope cooled down to what the temperature is going to be at night. That's funny. That's Way cool. ahead of time. Yeah. And then they'll fool me. They won't cool it to that. But yeah, that's the uh, the quintet. The quintet is also the one in um, It's a Wonderful Life, isn't it? I think the beginning scene where oh, you see yeah, the yeah. galaxies up there and they're talking. <laughs> well, why don't we uh, why don't we wrap it up at here? So, so thanks as always, Gary. It's wonderful to uh, and you know we got to put the spotlight right on you and you showed us. I I, can't, I lost count of how many objects we got a chance to see tonight. So, absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Mm. Well, I'm glad I could be here for you. Um, and thank you very much to Dr. Nicole Gallucci and Dr. Ted Sabo for, and, uh, and soon to be Dr. Scott Lewis in a Woo! couple of years. <laughs> soon is a... Wide in astronomical on an astronomical time scale? Uh, astronomical it's really soon. soon. So soon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I thank you, everybody reference. watching. So I will set up an event for next week. Uh, the next thing that we're doing, we'll be recording Astronomy Cast tomorrow at uh, noon Pacific. Um, and then we've got the weekly science hour, which is on Wednesday afternoon at 4 Pacific. And then we do the weekly space hangout on Thursday at 10 a.m. Pacific. So lots of good space, science, astronomy stuff coming up. So uh, oh, thanks for watching, and we will see everybody next week. And just for quick reference, hey, I'm really not this wide. This for some reason, <laughs> it's the camera. It's what it's the, the camera, camera does, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's no, you're sitting here black hole. It's okay. Yeah. You're just well, and actually, while we're all here, um, plug, quick plug, 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 plug. Earlier this week, Asteroid Mappers launched on CosmoQuest to go over Vesta. The Dawn mission has just left Vesta and is heading over to Ceres. So all of you can go out and sign up for free if you haven't already to go to CosmoQuest and start mapping the asteroid Vesta. If you haven't, you can also follow us on Twitter, which is at Asteroid Mappers. And Vesta will talk to you because Vesta is awesome like that. Anthropomorphic space objects. Woo! Yes. Woo! Yeah. So you can get that at CosmoQuest. Yeah. Science. You can do science too. We'll help Absolutely. you. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you guys all, all right, next everybody. time. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.